Good morning to everybody, everybody who is following today's lecture in our online lecture series, Mobility Analysis and Planning for Human Scale Cities. This is the semi final lecture in the series, which is supported by the Erasmus Plus Jean Monnet Network, Cooperative, Connected and Automated Mobility, EU and Australian Innovations. Previous lectures are available as recordings on the lecture series website at transportplanning.org ut.ee. Today, we are very happy to welcome here in our Zoom space, Professor Anthony Elliott, who will give a talk entitled No One Driving, Technologies, Systems, Retrotopias. Anthony Elliott is a professor of sociology and the executive director of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence and Network at the University of South, South Australia. He's a prominent social theorist, sociologist, and public intellectual. He writes about identity, society, globalization, and the digital revolution. His research has had a lasting impact upon social theory and sociology worldwide. And currently, he leads several international teams investigating the social impact of digital technologies, robotics, and artificial intelligence. If you have any questions during the lecture, please post them on chat. We will have the question and answer session in the end of the lecture. Welcome, Anthony. Now the screen will be yours. Well, uh, thank you very much for that really kind introduction, Professor Age Poom. And uh, thank you. Good morning to everyone over there. Uh, in Estonia. Greetings from Australia. We're late in the afternoon. You're early in the morning, so we've got a better sense of what today may actually hold for everyone, or at least that's the way it seems. Um, I'm very, very delighted to have this opportunity to take part in this online lecture series. I've uh, been having a look at the diversity of talks that have been given in it, and I'm very impressed by what uh, both um, Professor Poom and her colleagues there have been able to put together in terms of uh, a number of uh, very prominent and distinguished speakers. So uh, congratulations to you all. Um, and I hope I don't let the team down today with what I'm about to present. So um, Age just referenced the title of the talk, which is No One Driving. I just will make some very brief mention of that. Um, I mean, it sounds like a good title for a mobility lab at the University of Tartu to be uh, interested in. A couple of people have said to me here, when they've seen the title, oh, is that uh, reference to Ballard? Uh, to, to J.G. Ballard. Well, it isn't actually. It's a reference to a British museum, a British musician by the name of John Fox. He released an album in 1980 that was called Metamatic. And there was a song on that that would actually went to, got into the UK top 40. that was called No One Driving. And Fox in that Metamatic album had a remarkable uh, blending of the kind of utopic and dystopic vision of what kind of cities we might be looking at in the 21st century. He was, you know, this is obviously 40 plus years ago. Um, anyway, uh, I always particularly like that song, but I like the atmosphere that that album created. So this title is partly inspired by that particular track, No One Driving, um, but I've thrown Retrotopia in there because as I say, Fox had a very nice blend of the utopic and the dystopic. And, uh, the late Polish sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, his posthumously published book *Retrotopia*, argues that this, the in the you know the early days of early years of the 21st century, this is just the kind of world we now inhabit, where we are all of us increasingly going back to the future. So let's take a look at what that means. I've been in my work uh, over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years with my colleagues here at the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, but also uh, in this international network, the Jean Monnet Network for Cooperative Connected Mobilities, of which Professor Poom and uh, her colleagues at Tartu are members of. 
Um, I've been increasingly concerned with trying to understand the impacts of the digital revolution. And um, I've come up with a term that for better or worse tries to encapsulate uh, the, the span and the scope of that revolution. And the term that I use is that of um, technological tsunami. A technological tsunami, ladies and gentlemen, by which I'm referring to the growing gradual realization that more and more people have today, I believe that their core sense of self, their professional and their personal identities are being rendered increasingly unfit for purpose, unfit for purpose uh, and largely as a result of the intrusion of digital technologies into the very fabric of their identities. So this is the dawning realization, certainly in the expensive polished cities of the West, but not only there, that individuals today need to undertake a set of revisions, a set of recalibrations, a set of restructurings of their identities, and, you know, largely by, if we think of the world of travel, transport and tourism, largely by getting hold of the, you know, the latest Uber update or something from a download from Strava um, or the latest city planner guide in order to be able to get on and to confront the challenges of urban mobility. Uh, and yet, curiously more than that, because the insidious implantation of anxiety that whatever um, downloadings and uploadings are actually undertaken in order to be able to get on with the challenges of today, this kind of worry at the back of your mind that whilst that might see you through today, it's not going to be adequate to confront the challenges of tomorrow. And that therefore, you know, this is all going to start again and as if from scratch, and on and on in a kind of infinite regress. Well, this world of technological tsunami, I mean by it certainly things like smart cities and smart travel, but I mean by it much more than just that. So I'm referring to the encompassing world of certainly artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, accelerating automation, predictive analytics, uh, machine learning, neural networks, big data, and the internet of things, which of course is now fast becoming the internet of everything. And, you know, as if all of that, as if all of that is, it would, is not enough for women and men to be dealing with in these early decades of the 21st century, in my opinion, a critical social science of digital mobility also needs to reckon into account a series of other major transitions which are occurring at the current juncture. And they include, I won't have any time to talk about these in any detail today, but just to note them, they include developments in biotechnologies, nanotechnology, as well as a series of transformations occurring in information science more generally. Well, it seems that, you know, issues of movement of people, of information, of ideas, communication and objects have been profoundly impacted by this digital revolution that I'm talking about, particularly those innovations in AI and robotics and accelerating automation as the great wave of AI has broken out across the world, the living of our everyday lives has become digitally embedded in new ways of interacting and communicating on the move. So I want to suggest to you that AI is not so much geared towards the future as it's very much just actually anchored in the here and now in the present. And it's applied as a general purpose technology, which is pretty much underpinning everything from our daily travel paths um, through GPS navigation to the circulation of money via check scanning machines at ATMs. Artificial intelligence has in short become crucial to the reordering of everyday life and it deeply permeates people's mobile lifestyles. What John Ari and I in our book Mobile Lives argued 
is a fundamental transformation of these early decades of the 21st century. And that runs all the way from receiving Amazon recommendations through to requesting an Uber, or from getting information from virtual personal assistants through to talking to chatbots. Digital technologies and AI thus engender new modes of everyday uh, life. Through its lightning speed delivery of big data, referential calculations, sentient environments, location tagging, algorithms, and robots. The diverse intersecting mobilities of travel, transport, and tourism are similarly undergoing change as a result of this intensive automation. We've got new forms of automated travel that are now well underway because of technological innovations in camera technology and GPS, all coupled to smart transportation development blueprints and the commercialization of driverless technology. So um, as we know, we've got uh, tech giants from Google through to Uber, along with automotive manufacturers such as Tesla, GM, Daimler, Ford, Jaguar, Audi, BMW, and on and on. We know that they've all been very busy getting on with developing these self-driving vehicles. One estimate has it that one in four cars will be self-driving by the 2030. And as we know, there are already driverless trucks at the port of Rotterdam and automated lorries on the M6 in the UK. You've got other novel forms of automated vehicles now also emerging. So we've seen, for example, automated flying taxis, um, piloting over the skies of Dubai, computerized mapping drones or UAVs have been providing accurate up-to-date geographic data to various humanitarian agencies and autonomous weapon systems uh, increasingly are used to identify targets without human input in war battle zones. They're just some of the most recent technological advances which I think are remobilizing social life today. Now, alongside that, you've got the internet and social media that have rapidly expanded as a result of new innovations in AI with significant impacts in terms of the restructuring of communicative and virtual mobilities, as well as novel blends of online and offline social worlds. So social media, cloud computing and supercomputers more broadly have played a central role in all of this, but so too do smart products, services and devices, You've got 3D printing, intelligent ecosystems, virtual reality, augmented reality, and complex algorithms. Now, all of this is what the British geographer Nigel Thrift has called the informational overlay, yeah? The informational overlay of contemporary societies. And it's an overlay which reorientates social life away from the sort of face-to-face -face interaction um, of traditional forms of social life and instead generates new forms of digitally mediated interaction, which essentially transforms the coordinates, I believe, of time and space. So for example, it's I think more and more evident that people are interacting with intelligent machines and are likely to um, in the future, not through just keyboards uh, and, and mice, but increasingly through natural language processing, which is already making headlines as a kind of game-changing technology for virtual personal assistance. An increasing number of consumer devices um, have recently appeared on the market that pretty much dispense altogether with the kind of conventional interfaces, and we know them well. I'm thinking of things like Amazon's Alexa or Google's Home. Other instances of these novel interfaces include, as I say, augmented and virtual reality, um, interactive holograms, computational mood analysis and prediction, and wearables. Still, there are other emerging interfaces, these probably some years away, you know, from widespread commercialization, which include immersive haptics, multifunction implants, so, you know, the kind of the beginning of cyborgs, human augmentation, and exoskeletons. 
And indeed, you know, it's arguable that um, that with exoskeletons, that the the human body uh, has just increasingly now been rendered itself a self-driving car. Take a look at this. This is um, something from Mercedes that um, makes this point very clearly. So when I get into my 2020 Mercedes, there's a lot of linguatronic. You can talk with the car. Yes. This one, you don't talk with it. No, here you we don't talk with it. Yes, it's, it's, yeah, imagine once you talk with the car, it's more issue and command. You know, we want to reduce this uh, idea and say, hey, this uh, element is more like a skin of ourselves, like a digital membrane of ourselves which uh, um, influence us and can, can provide us an amplify experience to our outside world. We have a more dialogue-based system. And um, of course, machine learning already can do a lot of things, but uh, we are trying to really that this living organism is starting approaching the human and not we as a human are approaching the machine, which is very different. Should we go inside? It? Yes, let's do it. Do you want to say which one? I don't care. Both is fine. We can steer the car from both sides. True. I'll take the other one. Cool. I'm going there. So what do we see? We see no steering wheel. We see no buttons. We see no touch screen, no paddles. No. But in the middle console, we see a device. We call it merge control. Mm -hmm. And what we see is full sighting. And once you want to connect with the machine, we put down our hand. What happens in my seat? And you, you feel the vibration in the seat of the exciters. You feel the heartbeat. It's my heartbeat now. And now we are connected to the system. So normally, you as a human, you approach the car. So you steer the steering wheel, you touch the screen, you issue a command. But uh, we did it very differently in the Vision ABTR. Mm -hmm. In the Vision ABTR, you lift your hand, and icons are projected <gasps> into your skin. I'm not touching the display anymore or pushing a button. No. But what I do is... I raise my hand, you can do the same thing on your side, and then I move left and right, and you see that icons are projected onto my skin, into yes. my palm. So all your senses are triggered, not only the visual one, but also the haptic one and the acoustic one. And then let So, arguably, we are all just exoskeletons now of these automated mobilities. You're connecting with the machine or is the machine connecting with you? Um, we'll come back to that. But the point is these developments, I'm gonna suggest directly impact aspects of economic, social and cultural life that in some sense are being radically mobilized or pushed to be on the move. And what's new about the current conjuncture, I think, is the way in which the global digital economy is mobilizing the massive pool of networked intelligent machines of interconnected AI self-learning and sentience for what I call the kind of re-grooving, the re-grooving of both institutional life and processes of self-constitution. Just think about it. In the past, industrial processes of automation were very much fixed in place. They were programmed for specific repetitive tasks. More recently, digital technologies which link deep learning, neural networks and pattern recognition have become increasingly central to the process of organizational life, often displaying a you know, kind of automaticity, which is, I think, mobile, it's um, situationally aware, and it can adapt to and communicate various socio-technical environments. So this is a really, you know, this is a quantum leap in machine intelligence, and it's being characterized by data-driven computing rather than instruction-driven computing. And that's emerged through the kind of exponentially growing quantities um, and processing power of data, together with the development of complex algorithms, which has all led to these new capacities for self-organization, sense-making, um, insight extraction, and problem-solving. Advances in cloud computing, machine to machine communications, and the Internet of Things have simultaneously developed incredibly rapidly, much, much faster than previous technologies, and with huge consequences for mobile lives, as well as the complex mobility systems upon which enterprises 
and institutions depend. Some recent research has underscored the centrality of automated mobilities to this global digital economy. And there are major contributions, as you will all know, from disciplines such as sociology, of course, geography, cultural studies, um, science and technology studies, anthropology and tourism and transport studies. Well, prophecies about the reinvention of cities focus especially on the um, freeing potential and promise of driverless cars in particular. And as it happens, notwithstanding that many experts predict that full adoption of autonomous vehicles is not going to happen well into the 2030s, advanced AI underpins this sort of rollout today of many autonomous vehicles. Um, and I've just mentioned that you've got technology giants like Tesla and Volvo and Daimler um, and all the rest busy developing these um, self-driving vehicles. A recent McKinsey report that was uh, entitled The Futures of Mobility, How Cities Can uh, Best Benefit, claims that in over 50 metro metropolitan areas around the world today, home to over some 500 million people, integrated mobility systems can produce uh, radical benefits, such as improved safety and reduced pollution worth up to an estimated 600 billion US dollars. So these integrated mobility systems are very much those where AI management protocols enable a range of public and private modes of mobility to effectively, I think, interface with each other. So for instance, this level of coordination required for what they call seamless journeying among trains, planes, buses, cycling, walking, and so on, along with the sort of driven and self-driving vehicles has now moved very much kind of center stage as a, in public and academic debate. And among the benefits of these so-called seamless journey systems are various cost and time savings, uh, decongestion, reductions in CO2 emissions, uh, as well as the revitalization of urban centers. Among the key promises of autonomous driving technologies, the report notes uh, increases in road safety, reductions in the cost of transportation, and expanded access to mobility. Uh, it's also argued that uh, the Internet of Things could enable the generation of data to facilitate much better trip planning, as well as guiding autonomous vehicles based on real time conditions. So my question there effectively is that all sounds interesting up to a point, but how accurate actually is it in terms of the lives that people today live on the ground? Well, one way in which I think we can develop and we, that we need to as researchers in the social sciences and the humanities, one way in which we can try to develop a more nuanced understanding of how that kind of portrait stacks up uh, against the actual daily realities that women and men live in the early decades of the 21st century is by looking at the sort of the systems and the infrastructures uh, that are increasingly being rewritten uh, by new technologies, algorithmic technologies and automated technologies, and to focus in particular on the rather complex and uneven distribution, yeah? the uneven, the complex and uneven distribution of these trends and of these properties. Yeah, in a book that I wrote um, some years ago, a book called The Culture of AI, I actually uh, in that book, I identified 13 uh, complex digital systems that uh, are impacting contemporary societies in the rewriting of mobility systems uh, around the world today. Um, don't worry, I'm going to save you from that this morning, but I do want to go through just five, five of the absolutely key ones here, just so that you get a sense of how I want to try to open this up um, to a kind of more nuanced understanding of um, how automated mobilities actually sort of play out in the lives of contemporary women and men today. 
So of these five, let me start with this. The first here, I'm just simply referring to the, um, the extensity really of AI systems. So the scale and the scope of artificial intelligence across the globe today. Now we know that artificial intelligence has its origins in, um, in geopolitics, which it both impacts and transforms. Uh, I think uh, in the research that I've been doing, I think it's really important to see that AI constantly interlaces with the forces of globalization. Yeah. Um, that's not a claim that I'm going to go on to defend in any detail here. I would refer you to Richard Baldwin's book, Globotics. Uh, I think it's really interesting uh, book, Richard Baldwin's book, Globotics, where he makes the argument that artificial intelligence is interwoven uh, in very complex, uneven ways with the forces, of, with processes of globalization. And he's referring particularly to processes of outsourcing, offshoring, but also reshoring. Baldwin tells, um, as it happens, many kind of really, I think, good anecdotes and stories where, you know, of, of um, for example, hotel rooms in London being, uh, you know, uh, services being provided increasingly by people sitting behind their computer terminals and cleaning these hotel rooms from cheap labor spots across the globe. And Baldwin asks the key question, you know, is that the future of the global electronic economy? Well, one way that you can try and get a handle um, on what's going on today. And we've got to remember that, you know, the main discourse about artificial intelligence, I think, has been fundamentally a discourse about power. You can see this in the way that various nation states have tried to develop research and investment strategies to exploit AI for socioeconomic benefit. One way that we can get a, an understanding of what's going on around the world today is just by simply identifying where all the AI hubs are located. And that's fairly easy because we know that they're located in Silicon Valley, in New York, in Boston, in London, in Beijing and Shenzhen. That tells you something about the sort of concentrations of power. Another way you can do it is by looking at, um, and let me apologize in advance here, you might have to squint at this chart and it's a chart now that's a little bit out of date, but I'll show it to you nonetheless. This, you see all these different flags there. This is um, some of the global AI race to develop these research and investment strategies. Um, I, um, this is a chart that I examined myself in some detail because a few years ago in Australia, I was invited by the Australian government to join the work of um, uh, uh, committee here undertaking a review uh, of artificial intelligence for the country's future social and economic benefit. And Australia actually came to, as, to the AI debate very late. Um, in fact, you'll see we don't really figure there on that chart. We came to it really quite late. Many countries had already developed their strategies. And it's kind of interesting because um, there's an election going on in Australia at the moment and AI doesn't figure really in this debate at the moment for the election at all. And that's partly because, you know, our debate over whether we were going to invest 30 or $50 million as a research and investment strategy pretty much got swamped. Um, of course, COVID-19 came along, which certainly didn't help. But my point to you this morning is to highlight that even if we doubled it and we talked about investing $100 million, all of this pales in comparison to what other countries are doing um, in their R&D strategy. So you've got countries there, let's just pick some at random. So the UK, uh, an investment of some 1.3 billion pounds um, into AI um, between now and 2025. Uh, France, where we've got another election going on, uh, so they're committed to a 1.8 billion euro investment between now and 2025. Um, but that sort of pales in comparison to if you start looking at regional levels of investment. So the European Union has been talking about a 20 billion euro investment into AI over the coming years. Um, and of course, you can trace that right through to the kind of superpowers where 
Arguably, China, at least in terms of its self-declaration, has um, identified a commitment of over 200 billion uh, US dollars uh, of investment into AI between now and 2030. It's very hard to actually know where the US is on this because it doesn't um, self-identify some of its in investment strategies in the same way. But my point is little wonder that with all of that going on, um, Price Waterhouse Coopers in a, in a report recently identified that artificial intelligence might be worth, might be worth in excess of some 16 trillion US dollars to the global economy by the year 2030. Key point again, bear in mind, that gives you some indication of the massive uh, unequal distributions of what's going on here, yeah? The second socio-technical system that I'd bring to your attention is that of automaticity. Um, and here I'm just simply referring, um, I mean, perhaps only a sociologist could come up with such an unlovely term. I'm, I'm just trying to underscore something about the increasing centrality of automated algorithmic systems to the production of social and personal life today. The economist, Brian Arthurs, I think, captures this really well when he talks about the arrival of a second economy, kind of new economy, an AI-enabled, um, data-driven uh, economy that is parasitic upon the general economy. But as Arthur points out, this, this uh, new economy is driving, as it were, pardon the pun, driving an awful lot of the general economy. Um, and, you know, that can be all the way through from um, AI guided um, surgical interventions through to developments that we're seeing uh, in mobility systems uh, today. The third socio-technical change that I think is going on is notwithstanding my emphasis on these differentiations across the globe, at the same time, it's important to recognize that AI actually is an, a system that's unfolding in increasingly ubiquitous ways. Um, so that is to say that today we've got these complex digital systems that are everywhere now just busy distributing, sorting, resorting, and transferring information more or less, more or less instantaneously across global networks. So, you know, you can kind of, from that angle, think of AI as a kind of surround. It's a, a kind of, um, kind of, you know, background wallpaper uh, informing just what it is that we do in our daily lives, whether we're aware of it or not. Adam Greenfield captures this very nicely when he writes that AI systems are everywhere, W-H-E-R-E, -E, and everywhere, W-A-R sorry, W-A-R-E. Um, but as I say, uh, what's interesting here is that AI is enabling these various kind of protological infrastructures, if I could put it that way. It's enabling these new protological infrastructures, which increasingly make possible, you know, the um, registrations, the authorizations, the calculations and the connectivities, the uploads and the downloads, which somehow magically and mysteriously means that social life just happens. The fourth socio-technical transformation that I think is going on here, um, we're getting through these fairly quickly now, is that these AI systems are increasingly complex and complicated. Complex and complicated. Um, I'm referring to the ways in which AI has um, enabled all sorts of innovations in ubiquitous computing, which itself is underpinned by all sorts of um, exponential patterns of growth. And of course, you think about it, Moore's law has very much been the guiding maxim since the sort of late 1960s in tech circles. A lot of talk about Moore's law, the, you know, the so-called doubling of computing power um, every 18 months to two years or so. Um, there's been a kind of big debate about that in terms of this kind of shrinkage 
of um, transistors onto these kind of microchips with companies like IBM and Intel saying, well, hang on, um, we're there's a bit of a problem here now because there's a, actually there's a limit to how much shrinkage uh, we can do of these transistors. Um, but then there's another school of thought that's been saying, no, actually, no need to be alarmed at all. Everything is alive and well on the innovation front. If you look at what's going on in quantum computing as conjoined to developments in cloud computing, um, these levels of exponential growth are likely to be um, self-propelling into the future. Um, my point to you this morning is that however that plays out, and I don't have a strong view on it, I, that's not something I followed that closely, but my sense of it is, is that we've got to re remain mindful of the fact that we're not just talking about technology here, yeah? We're not just talking about technology because the point is these transformations increasingly impact on everyone. And that, that, that complexity and the complicated nature of that innovation means that we are all, each of us, scrambling. Yeah, we're scrambling on a daily basis to incorporate many of these innovations um, into our daily lives. And that's a nice segue into the last um, uh, socio-technical trend I want to highlight. And it's this, we shouldn't think of AI and particularly of AI as it impacts uh, mobility and mobility systems. We shouldn't think of it as, a, as, a, as an out there process. It's actually, it's a kind of in here, it's in this room, it's in the room you're in, and it's in the space between how we're talking to each other here today. Um, so I think it's a mistake to, a lot of people think when they hear artificial intelligence, they think that's something that's happening to organizations, that it's happening to institutions, that it's happening to infrastructures. Well, yes, that's right, but it's also happening to identities and it's happening to our intimacies. So another way of making that point would be to say that um, AI goes all the way down. Yeah, all the way down right into the very heart of human subjectivity, right into the very fabric of interpersonal relationships. So, you know, it affects um, uh, friendship, it affects family life, relationships, um, uh, it affects sexuality and the body. You know, remarkably broad swathe uh, of change. And I think much of this, you know, comes back, we see this in our daily lives. I'm holding up here my mobile phone, um, you know, this is, okay, so these things we carry around with us in our pockets or in our bags, we know that the way things are heading, it's not going to be too long until they're sort of put inside our bodies. Um, and, you know, my point is that with these things, you've got remarkable algorithmic power um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you bear in mind this, this sort of device basically, you know, pulls together so many technological transformations, the equivalent of, of what, through a supercomputer, put a man onto the moon, um, even though if you're anything like me, you only probably use a fraction of that particular algorithmic power in your day-to-day -day life. But nonetheless, my point is, um, there's some sort of fundamental questions about what's going on here. Um, have, you know, do I have the machine or does the machine have me? This is something that we'll, that we'll come back to. Okay, so there are uh, a range of these sort of complex digital systems. And I want to, in the time that I've got left, which I think is about 20 minutes, uh, I want to bring this back now to the question of how we might think about mobility um, and how we might think about automated mobilities in particular and the claims about driverless vehicles. So on the basis of what I've been saying, I think in the end, from my standpoint, it's important to bear in mind that digital transformations fundamentally still, I mean, they're about people, yeah? It's about people facilitating us to live, you know, increasingly just in time lifestyles and to navigate high tech cities, certainly in novel ways. So from that angle, self-driving vehicles are, are not just about, you know, improved traffic flows or public safety, issues, however important they are, and obviously they are, but rather th these are changes that are set to transform how people actually spend time on the move. 
Now, recent research has highlighted that in the future, people are likely to uh, increase their capacities to undertake multiple forms of activity related to work and leisure whilst being on the move. So, you know, working, reading, studying, talking with others via digital devices will be increasingly prevalent among those traveling for both uh, business and leisure. With the arrival of automated vehicles and where driving no longer depends on a human driver, how might that actually play out? So uh, in the book that I referred to earlier, The Culture of AI, I argue that with the driver released from driving and thus in effect rendered another passenger, uh, the driverless car promises to become what I call a kind of new mode of dwelling. Uh, passengers in automated vehicles um, effectively move into these kind of high tech cocoons where they'll be able to undertake with limited distractions, um, creative activities, as I say, like working and reading and computing, as well as daydreaming and many other forms of imaginative escape and imaginative travel. So two, I think vehicles are gonna open up all sorts of new possibilities for social interaction. The interior cabin of cars, subsequent to the eclipse of a human driver, will be significantly reconfigured in design and layout, providing um, for greater flexibility for work, for dialogue, both online and offline, and for leisure and pleasure. So from this angle, cars with no one driving might thus be said to foster, as I say, this new kind of dwellingness, a kind of high cocoon um, type atmosphere in which passengers are cushioned from the external environment around them by smart grids, uh, informational uh, grids, as well as road systems on the one hand, and surrounded by all sorts of microelectronics and digital technology, including you know, internet, email, messaging, social media on the other. The future fully autonomous vehicle may represent a kind of sanctuary, a zone of privatism, however minimal, between points of departure and arrival, or at least it might for those fortunate enough um, to be able to get themselves into them. And that's a whole um, issue of politics that we might want to discuss. Okay, so a couple of possible conclusions here. And at this point, I, I wanna make um, two points. So the first possible conclusion is mostly sociological and it addresses the sort of the issue of the transform relation between individuals and systems. And the other one's largely theoretical. It addresses how human and non-human forces are continually interweaving in today's automated atmospheric dynamics of mobilities and constantly shifting social interactions around. Um, I'm going to offer these points to you simply as suggestive remarks towards perhaps what could be called a kind of algorithmic mobility standpoint. Um, these ideas, if you think they do merit any further attention, clearly will need to be developed and incorporated into a more systematic theoretical account of automated mobilities. So, firstly, the mobilities paradigm, I think, has to acknowledge, as it simply hasn't done before, that human-machine interaction is increasingly involved in the reproduction and transformation of mobile social life. So I'm referring here, of course, to the complex ways that new AI-enabled socio-technical systems shift humans, but also shift machines around in spatial and temporal configurations uh, relative to one another. And we see this occurring today, I think, in the redistribution, the reconfiguration and the remodeling of human machine relations and their multiple feedback loops, kind of the indirect relations of cause and effect, which increasingly now are playing out in different speeds and at different time scales. So Reflecting upon the extensive experience of engineering robotic technologies in extreme environments and relating those to current and pending deployments of AI in among other things, vehicle systems and healthcare, as actually as well as education, 
the engineer David Mendel, right? David Mendel has set out um, some really interesting proposals about these changes in human machine intersections arising today in conjunction with automation. Mendel, for example, suggests that what he thinks is occurring is the emergence of new forms of experience as these systems enable both human and machine presence, as well as human and machine co-presence to be distributed across space, at once physical, communicative and virtual, at once local and global, and as human machine interaction capabilities deepen and become you know, increasingly imbricated and co-active, you get what Mendel calls, and I quote, a delicate switching in and out of automatic modes. Yeah? A delicate switching in and out of automatic modes. I particularly like that phrase, I think it's very good. Intelligent machines then are, in this scenario are being drawn upon by you and I as social actors, both discursively and non-discursively in the very production of mobile social life. But at the same time, they are the very media of new forms of distributed code presence across time. So for example, with ongoing customer engagements with designers or with programmers whose work, yeah, whose very traces actually remain inside the machine systems, framing operations for months or possibly for years. From, I guess from a more critical vantage point, a focus on this kind of reconfiguration of human machine relationships allows for a more nuanced view of the disruptive impacts of these new technologies, including the displacement of large numbers of people through micro work or crowdsourcing applications, social media, or online video games to roles as indispensable system mediators. Yet at the same time, marginal, hidden, poorly compensated or uncompensated as naturalized as part of what it actually means um, to be a user today of digital technology. So in making this move to take in intelligent machines in the reconfiguration of how we think of ourselves as digitalized subjects, the relation between self and system or the relationship, another way of putting it, the relationship between agency and automation, I'm suggesting to you is being radically recomposed. The second point, uh, if we just go back to that image, the second point here is that I think the social theory of mobilities needs increasingly now to focus upon the patterns of smart technology and automated infrastructures which unlie, underlie sort of physical or communicative interactions that orchestrate social, economic and political life. So smart technologies, including both computational infrastructures as well as wearables, I think mark a new edge, yeah? A new edge in our understanding of mobilities. Social systems are beset and energized by the nonlinear dynamics of smart objects interacting with each other. And all of this is now happening whether human subjects seem to be uh, aware of it or not. So you've got smart technologies powered by AI increasingly comprising the basic frameworks that move subjects as well as moving objects within uh, interaction. Galloway and Thacker uh, have argued that they've sought to sort of capture um, in some of their work how these non-human objects shape, enable, and even interfere with networks engendered by new software. Uh, and building upon their work, Ash has argued that smart objects uh, possess uh, both intentionality and protentionality. That is the ability to actively perturb other objects or to wait and respond to such interventions. Using the example of a range of existing mundane technologies, among them things like you know the, um, the sun nest cam or drift light bulb or the Dyson 360i, Ash in his work claims that through this kind of capacity and at times also the incapacity to perturb one, one another, smart objects create different spatial and temporal logics of near and far, 
um, or of now and then, thereby modulating the ways in which space and time become intelligible to both humans and to other non-humans. Whilst Ash concedes that this capacity of smart objects to shape intelligibility and to organize human life through framing of space and framing of time can lend itself to a view of smart objects as instruments as instruments or agents of economic and political life, he's also keen to point out the ways in which these technologies um, shape our potentials for actions in ways that we haven't anticipated or in ways that aren't controlled by their designers or their manufacturers. So, you know, relations between smart objects are thus kind of implicated in the production of social life as a kind of technological unconscious a kind of technological unconscious to come back again to Nigel Thrift. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for bearing with me there. That was a bit of a diversion, those points into some quite um, complex theoretical terrain. And I want to, I guess, um, try to reach for a conclusion now um, by essentially asking the question, uh, which a question I'll put to all of you, uh, this morning, can our societies actually tolerate this pace of change? So uh, another way of perhaps asking that question would be to say, what future for us? What future for us living in these AI-enabled cities? Well, from one angle, I suppose it's tempting to envision cities of the future as a kind of mix of, say, you know, um, Helsinki, with its multiple mobility modes uh, and Singapore, you know, with its seam seamless digital integration, uh, as well as Buenos Aires with its pioneering data analytics in managing urban traffic. Yet I think any attempt to actually extrapolate from current urban spaces is very likely to fall wide of the mark, uh, given that AI is part and parcel of the digital revolution. And that's important, yeah? That's important because as with all social revolutions, no one can actually say with any degree of confidence where all of this is heading. It's a, a key point that I really wanna stress this morning. No one can say with any degree of confidence where this is heading. And that's one of the reasons why experts now so thoroughly disagree with each other. So you've got a situation today, I think where artificial intelligence is transforming cities in quite novel and experimental ways. And as such, it's the cities themselves which are increasingly becoming reinvented. So the future of cities, at least I think as far as mobility is concerned, could possibly be, um, you know, we see this a lot in the literature, modern cities described as free floating, as dockless, with rolling transportation options, you know, bikes, cars, scooters, buses, trains, taxis, uh, materializing digitally on, on multi-modal journey planners. AI cities of the future underpinned by mobility services combining GPS and uh, cellular technologies are gonna be environments where there's really no choice but to keep actively choosing. And I think we can see the glimmerings of much of this in urban spaces today from the dockless cycle higher uh, in things like, you know, mo bikes, bike sharing um, through to um, all sorts of new options on electric scooters to Daimler's short car hire service, car to go, the car to go app. Um, how might those urban design and planning features proceed in the light um, of AI? Well, uh, in terms of public policy, and government, I would have thought a range of strategies are gonna be required to confront both the opportunities and the risks of AI and self-driving technologies rather than just one single approach. Um, I think the consideration is going to need to be given to, among other things, the regulation of testing under real world conditions, the um, complex relations between driverless and driven vehicles, uh, things like you know infrastructural requirements, certainly questions about cybersecurity, uh, liabilities at law, and the impacts on work and employment. Um, much obviously is also going to depend, I think, on getting the right mix of global governance, 
uh, local regulation, um, civil society participation, industry support, and business compliance. So, the, you know, the development and the deepening of digital understanding throughout populations, um, perhaps above all, is going to be, I think, of, of absolutely central importance. And a vital question there concerns whether our societies can tolerate, yeah, the degree to which they can emotionally tolerate, can live with, or in the words of Susie Orbach, develop the kind of um, emotional literacy, yeah, the kind of emotional literacy to deal with the pace of change, to deal with the kind of uncertainties that AI is going to introduce uh, into driverless vehicle systems in particular, as they unleash all of these changes, as well as react creatively to these changes um, and to see the extent to which women and men can become open towards constantly evolving um, digital transformation. Well, um, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, I should just finish by noting that for any of you that are interested, if you'd like to know more, you could find it all in this um, very stylish, remarkably glossy um, and very cheap uh, offering that's just recently been released by Polity Press um, in the UK. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anthony, uh, so much for this fascinating talk, uh, raising so many, so many questions and uh, and making us a bit um, like chilly. The, the feeling is is not so comfortable, I would say. So, after your talk, uh, uh, we have we have now here uh, a little audience also here in our uh, seminar room and. Um, we go for the questions and if any uh, of the participants of this early session in the morning uh, on Zoom would also like to post any questions, you're welcome to do so. Please raise your hand or, or write uh, your question to the chat. Um, I, 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 had, I have to choose, uh, uh, Anthony, so, so what to you, what you take for the first. I have uh, so, so many thoughts here. In a way, when we are talking about a human scale cities, uh, planning, planning the mobility uh, for human scale cities. So, so this um, AI driven and data driven mobility um, future uh, does not seem to be very human scale. It, 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 it's rather artificial technological, this flossy um, without any sense, like personal sense. So these are like empty spaces, these are um, these systems enhance individualism uh, and loneliness. And we also, when thinking, when we are thinking about uh, people who need also assistance in their mobility, like children or older people. So these artificial technologies might even enable uh, those population groups to be more alone in also in those mobility situations. Otherwise, when they have been talking, communicating with their assistants, so uh, how do you see that this future is going to affect uh, population groups who are vulnerable? How, how to protect them or how to increase or, or be aware of the risks and, and, and guide or govern the, the, um, the development in a way that we do not harm those who cannot defend themselves or choose, choose by themselves? Yeah, um, well, from one angle, I'd simply say to you, gosh, I don't know, um, in the sense of answering the key part, which is the latter part of your question. Um, but in, in terms of picking up on the language and the discourse, the ideology and the atmospherics of so much of AI, um, yes, it, it is remarkable, isn't it, that it's particularly in terms of the options for mobility that are often presented, um, it is rather, from one angle, soulless, lifeless. Um, there is a sense in which much of the discourse, I mean, that whole language of, you know, the seamless travel experience, uh, I mean, it's it's illusory through and through in that, I mean, all of us, 
know and recognize that that's simply not how life is. You know, life is complex, it's contradictory, it's messy and it's bumpy and it's full of ambivalence and ambiguity. I don't want to sound like I'm taking everyone on a downer. Um, yeah, I mean, it can be great fun and there's huge amounts of excitement, but we know that life is made up of various thrills and spills. And it is fascinating that for all of the new engineered connectivities, for all of the breakthroughs and innovations in software development and the sort of blending of computation on the one hand and mobility on the other, that you end up with a, a fairly soulless machine, which I think, as you rightly say, Arge, is actually trying to reposition subjects in these worlds which are uh, largely um, isolated and isolating. Um, now, from one angle, of course, a skeptic would say, well, that's hardly surprising, given that in neoliberal times, um, that artificial intelligence, you know, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's in a broader social historical world um, of advanced capitalism. And, you know, therefore, it's not entirely surprising that we get these images from big tech and related digital um, enterprises, which are trying to create a kind of image of life, an image of algorithmic life, um, as being a bit akin to the sort of pleasures of traveling business class or first class. You know, you don't have to do all the difficult, you know, all the difficult hard work of, of travel. This is all going to be seamless and smooth and everything works perfectly. Um, it's the bit that I'm interested there, mostly in, even though I don't have the answer for you and I wish I did, but, but the second part of your question is fascinating because of course, so much is missed out on. I mean, given, um, at least just even in my limited capacity of now studying artificial intelligence and related developments in the digital revolution over these last 10 years, it's extraordinary that if you think about it in terms of issues of the different types of individuals, the different types of bodies, the different types of ableness of, of limitation and constraint, that with all of this sort of um, really innovative and interesting engineering that's going on in these domains in automated spaces and algorithmic spaces that more emphasis isn't put on the ways in which um, if not solutions at least some interesting sounding questions can now be raised anew about forms of travel um, forms of uh, cooperation and care in terms of the provision of mobility services um, for the different um, groups and subgroups to which you're referring. So from one angle, of course, there's a massive opportunity here that seems to, um, I mean, it's not being missed entirely, but it seems to be squeezed to the sidelines. I, I was interested to note that when um, self-driving vehicles, I think were first launched in Helsinki, there was that little um, bus that was effectively, it was, you know, the self-driving bus was trialed in one of the um, outer or maybe mid outer, you know, suburbs in Helsinki, where you had all sorts of different, you know, uh, people from different forms of life tri trialing that bus in order to come into Helsinki. And I mean, it was a story that was very much carried in community newspapers and, and that sort of thing. Um, but as we know, for the most part, a great deal of media and social media and the sort of headline news seems to be still around that narrative of, you know, AI is all about a kind of radically different future. AI is either um, a world of kind of killer robots or uh, AI, you know, just taking all our jobs and destroying our livelihoods. Um, so look, it is, it is a, a remarkable occurrence that so much of um, you know, public service, so much of commercial enterprise, um, and frankly, so much of the sort of possibility here doesn't seem to be picked up on. Um, I mean, obviously we're talking about it, so um, we're aware of it. And I think particularly in terms of the level of innovation, 
um, what prompt, at least in my experience of talking to engineers and computer scientists and mathematicians and many people that work in these companies that are focused on that kind of hard edge, as it were, of technological innovation, much of what they do is actually very much driven by impulses to confront and to come up with solutions for the kind of things that you're talking about. So it's going to be interesting to what extent in the future much of this keeps getting squeezed to the sidelines um, or to what extent we can actually broaden this out to a more uh, broader human debate. I'll finish by saying this. I do think um, at the sort of level that, that, that I work at, which is um, very much focused on the sort of broad theoretical questions and parameters that inform social science and humanities research. I think it's terribly important, as I've been trying to argue this morning, to inject um, emotional life back into this, to inject um, however much uh, uh, you and I as human subjects that are decentered and dispersed by these technological networks, we still have a voice. We're still a party to the dialogue. We can be quite involved in it, however at times disorient disorientating and alarming it might seem. So I, I see that as being a critical function of a um, algorithmically informed uh, mobilities uh, model. Yes, so thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, still a continuation from that. I'm still puzzled uh, about the, the balance between the public and private profit or good uh, from, from these developments and by private uh, benefit, uh, we can talk about individuals and as well as the big power, powerful players like tech companies and, and those who drive uh, this innovation. Um, when, we, when we talk about um, the urban futures, so that how that can how this seamless mobility can enhance the public life, improve public safety, even pollution. You said so. Actually, all this innovation it's 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 not governed. It's in a in a way developing very in a dichotomic way, like ad hoc development is going on. There are so many different players. The systems are complex, as you also stressed. The, the life cycle of all individual uh, solutions is quite short. New data, new tools, new systems come in, new players come in. There are so many standards and, and yet the, the system is, or the whole system is unstandardized. And I see that the private, sorry, the public part, the, the public governments uh, actually do not grasp the whole system holistically. They do not own the data, they do not own the, uh, the, the tools, they don't, don't have regulations in place which are strong enough. So, so for me, this nice uh, seamless mobility urban future is actually, actually something which is seem like wishful thinking, because we cannot put all these all these tools and parts and bits in, into one system that, that each of us in the in our societies can actually benefit from those. So, so still you need to have like certain skills, you need to have certain access to systems to actually start benefiting from, from those. So I'm puzzled about the balance between public and private good. Can you? Yeah, so I, I'd yeah. be interested. Yeah, no, I, well, uh, it, it's an absolutely central question because of course so much of the debate in terms of public, private, um, divisions and forms of cooperation, um, certainly not only here in Australia, but in many of um, the countries on that chart that I put up earlier as they've sought to develop these uh, AI R&D strategies. And as you and your colleagues there will know, if just looking at the work of the European Commission and the way this the sort of debate over digitalization has played out in Europe, where you get the public getting very much at the centre of all of this is over the questions of the kind of ethics of um, these digital systems. So, you know, the, the arguments for a kind of transparent AI, um, for accountable AI, um, we've, I would see this as one of the major debates that's happened. It's, and it's, it's where you actually go beyond the academic discussion of artificial intelligence today, where we've seen AI land on newspapers and, and radio and television, has, as I say, it's either been about robots taking out jobs or it's been about the kind of ethical challenges 
and the kind of world that we're going into with big tech increasingly taking our data and selling that on to appropriately repackaged as into you know behavioral futures markets and people are pretty angry about that for a whole host of reasons and rightly so but again i guess my response to you is that so much of so many public agencies have missed the opportunity to be a part of this because it's pretty much been left to the private sphere it's pretty much been left to the startups to the digital companies to the tech companies um, and I think that's part of what's driven tech lash, you know, the whole phenomena of kind of, of a tech lash where people feel a great deal of resentment. And I think people are increasingly caught in that sense of their split between realizing that, you know, you need these devices, you, you need this digitalization to do so many things today in contemporary life. Otherwise you simply are left out. You, so there's now so much that you can't do. And this was really brought home to us, I think, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, particularly here in Australia, where there was just so many initiatives by government that nothing could really be accessed outside of digitalization, which left so many elderly people, again, scrambling because they didn't know how to be able to, to do so much of this. Um, and it's a, it's, again, it's a curious sort of anomaly because why leave that side of the equation just so open-ended? And why, why does um, government both at, you know, all the way from regional forms of governance, global governance, but right down to national and local forms of um, public policy and social policy, not even be able to imagine a greater role for itself in many of these initiatives? In the if you think of the sector in which we work in education, um, it's kind of extraordinary because obviously against the backdrop now of the con combined forces of globalization and digitalization, you've got incredible synergies now happening at a number of levels in the delivery of teaching and the way in which research is being undertaken. And, and this again has become just really a kind of open slather for for private agencies and markets to sort of move into and determine how they're going to do this. Um, and I mean, yes, okay, so it's very important we look and examine where how data is being harvested, monitored, extracted, and where it's sold onto. But I don't think that's, that's the whole of the game. Um, so again, I don't have an answer for you on, on um, sort of exactly what those next steps would be. But I think people are increasingly aware of it. I think there's a desire for it. There's a hunger for a greater role for, for, for a public involvement and not just for a kind of withdrawal and apathy. Yeah, and public involvement in a way which is not overtaken by totalitarian systems or, or those forces which we also would, would hope to be so. Any questions from our audience here? Maybe I have one. And because uh, I'd mean, like to ask, what do you think about uh, how this high technology will affect uh, the urban space physically and in roads and infrastructure in near future? Because from the past, we know that uh, cars uh, affect, has a huge effect on our cities, uh, road became wider and so on. And now, if we're talking about this amount of cars problem with the city space, so how do you think it, uh, with high technologies, the amount of car will be smaller because the technology is expensive and the no, uh, not everyone can allow it to buy? Or what do you think about this in this point of view? I sort of got that and I sort of didn't. So could, could you just give me a truncated summary of that question? Okay. Um, no, 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 sorry. Maybe if I, I, I think yes. the, the speaker is too far away from the microphone. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry for this. So my question was, uh, what do you think about high, how this high technology and self-driving car will affect our urban space physically? I mean, infrastructures and roads in near future. So, and what uh, do you think about the amount of cars because ex uh, technology is expensive and not every, everybody can allow it to have and what do you think about in this way? Well, look, it's a great question. And I'd like to say, please come and visit Australia because it's, it's really, um, it plays out with a vengeance here at the moment. Because if you want to get your hands on 
Um, I was talking about this with my colleagues just before we got going in this presentation. So the secondhand car market here has gone crazy um, because it's, it's not possible, it's really difficult to buy new cars and get new cars here into Australia um, as a result of what's happened to the supply chains and COVID and now the war and all the rest of it. But um, then there's, we've got the further problem in Australia where there's been very, very little government action and underwriting um, of uh, the possibility for sufficient, sensible and adequate transformations into electric cars, let alone to more experimental forms of automated mobilities. Um, in, so from, from one angle, um, and that's what I mean about the un, uneven distribution of all of this, because that, oh, clearly there are big, big differences between trying to do some of this between say Sydney and San Francisco or San Francisco and Sao Paulo or wherever. So we've got to keep those kind of um, unequal power balance, imbalances in mind throughout. Another side of it though, just very quickly, I want to say to you, um, I often think some of this could be, you know, like potentially disastrous. So I don't know whether this has actually reached um, Estonia as yet, but I saw a news report yesterday on BBC World Service that the British government, right, has just actually made a decision. Now they don't have self-driving cars on the roads in the UK at the moment. They've got self-driving lorries and that kind of stuff. But the Department of Transport has announced that self-driving cars are set to go live in the UK later this year. So the government's actually looking at all forms of new regulation and legislation. So this backs up to your earlier question too, Arge. And what they've decided in their wisdom, and I don't know whether this is the law in Estonia, but in Australia, if you're driving your car, um, you can't, if you're caught using your mobile phone or your mobile device, you're immediately, in, you, you're in trouble. You'll get a fine from the police. You're not allowed to do that. Well, you're not allowed to do that in the UK either. But yesterday in the UK, they've decided that in the self-driving vehicles, you will be able to watch television. So you'll be able to sit there and watch Netflix or watch your favorite show, even though you're not allowed to take a look at your screen and send a text, apparently it's okay um, you know, to watch an episode um, of Better Call Saul. So from that angle, it, it strikes me that, you know, th this is where we see a kind of, you know, sort of uh, legislative initiatives that seem radically out of kilter um, with the sort of uh, many of the, not only the sort of technical uh, innovations and the stages at which we're up to, but the level of the, the ways in which societies and individuals are responding to and trying to cope with these changes, because I would have thought most people would probably think that that kind of thing that the BBC was reporting on yesterday um, is not only kind of outrageous, but it's just plainly um, silly. Thank you, Anthony. Siri. Yeah, thank you. I think it was on the presentation was very many ideas to to think about uh, further and how the system and the cities is uh, going to be in the future. And uh, my my, I would like to bring uh, to the discussion of the topic of uh, citizens engagement. That uh, how it when it's the technical tools to to uh, people can use, and then it's. Um, uh, like Aga uh, brought out before, that uh, they they are not uh, used for each of the population groups, but uh, but mostly as I see that this technical solutions is from top down, more all these algorithms and how how these uh, solutions work. But what is uh, there at the uh, people's uh, conscious? Uh, thoughts at, or how they would uh, like to be in the city or move or manage as I see on this uh, technical they are more like um, uh, this algorithm can uh, can not bring but say where the people should go for example for this Google map solutions that they say that it is a, a better way to go in this way or you should uh, <coughs> Uh, choose in this sort of uh, uh, mobility uh, transportation modes or all is um, uh, said someone else uh, or, or some algorithm or some something what is uh, created um, uh, on the system. 
but how you see what is the uh, people's uh, choice to choose themselves what they would like to do in a city or how they would be moved there or or be be there yeah so S siri i think that's really uh, um a fascinating um point that you've raised and in i mean so there's part of me the way you've described that in terms of many of the from big tech um and and many of the sort of corporate designs that you've described as being top down um i mean obviously just in terms of what i've been saying earlier and we've 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 danced around this with some of the earlier discussions um this this is something that people return to time and again in questions i think around not only digitalization but the sort of digitalization of mobile life and what's happening today and it's it's undeniably the case i think part of me though um is very eager to and i think this is the the work of so much of the good sorry we just had an interruption there um so much of the critical social science in this field the impulse behind it is to try and preserve a space for areas of um not only innovation but particularly for experimentation and cultural ex experimentation so for I, what i mean by that is if you think back to something like um you know the introduction of tablets in the in the 2010s you know um when when tablets were sort of first uh released in the 2000s um i mean the whole thing bombed i mean there was a, a, an attempt to sort of release that for business executives and it was presented as this sort of new um computing device that would mostly be used in a very um adult like sensible fashion and the whole thing was a disaster um apple came back a bit later and tried it again and threw it out to market but threw it out in a way without telling people quite what it did and then you had the most extraordinary thing happen you had you know two year olds uh, using ipads to draw on you had six year olds watching movies on it you had you know people emailing and people looking up recipes and doing whatever um and what i mean by that is there's this whole realm of kind of cultural experimentation which can uh infuse technology and infuse devices and the sort of reconstituted social lives of technology in ways which are certainly unanticipated by engineers and computer scientists and you know that whole kind of infrastructural realm that goes on in and through technology so i think that's really important when we actually think about what city life might be like in the future um i for one and i mean where i live in adelaide we are meant to be a city of experimentation in terms of digitalization and as i grow older here i would like to think that um there's going to be a lot of that experimentation you know i i don't want things handed across to me where everything's pre-planned and pre-organized so that you simply have uh not only you know choose between options a and b but as we're increasingly seeing with companies like netflix you don't have to choose at all the algorithm just chooses for you so um i'm really sympathetic there to what you're saying and i think it's a really important point i think there's a lot of research going on in and around that area that's really interesting obviously you know a lot of it's got to be ethnographic and and interview based and so on and i think it's going to be sort of everything's to play for everything's to play for would be um part of my answer to you there um we just need to be on guard against the forces of big tech and that sort of that sense of forces pushing down upon us um because we're not small in we're not necessarily just puny uh individual subjects we are individuals of remarkable capability and dexterity uh, even though, of course, there's a great deal that goes on in through our lives that we don't necessarily know about and can't always know about. So th I think there's still everything to play for. This, this, yeah, thank you. This is the way. And and indeed, the systems might know much more about ourselves than, than we do. And, and also they know about our children. Um, maybe much more and, and their mobility preferences uh, as well and 
as now our our time uh, is up uh, maybe just a very final comment here we talked about innovation about development about how this ai is affecting our cultural economic social being uh, and and our urban spaces uh, but but we didn't talk about the future in, in the sense what is the what is the cemetery of ai what is the what, what will happen to the digital waste uh, and and everything what are the future traces of current ai systems that we see in our in our environments perhaps we don't know that right now but if you want to give a short comment on well, that. My comment, yeah, it's a chance for me to plug my book and tell you you should all read to the either the very last chapter or go straight to the last chapter because it's called The Futures of AI. And it's a, I think it's an incredibly interesting topic because um, so much of the future of technology and the future of digitalization is often cast, again, purely in technological terms. So I do look in that chapter at things like, you know, the technological singularity, the work of people like Ray Kurzweil. Um, of course, for, for futurists like Kurzweil, um, the year 2045 is, well, I won't say it's around the corner, but it's a lot closer than when he originally wrote the book. Um, we've got all these counter futures and alternative futures now, many of them, I think, far more disturbing than, well, equally disturbing as the kind of portrait that technologists like Kurzweil would like to see introduced. So, you know, obviously we've got, you know, things like the climate futures. How, how does our energy security possibly cope with a world of rapid digitalization on the scale um, that people like Kurzweil are talking about? How you know we're in enough trouble on this planet as it is without sort of introducing this kind of radicalization of the 200 billion plus devices that might run out of IoT by the year 2040. So they're really critical questions. But we've also just seen it with the pandemic. How we you know as societies, how do we cope with all of this? I think, I, and I'll stop talking because I know our time's up. But I would just say that I think that AI in general is sort of both condition and consequence. Um, of all of this, and by that I mean, you know, we saw it with the COVID, with the COVID pandemic, that AI, in a sense, the pandemic was was partly a response to an increasingly interconnected world, but at the same time, AI did such a lot to fast track the development of vaccines. Supercomputers played such a role in all of that. So it's not, it's never a dichotomy. I think it's a kind of complex dualism. Um, but given we are out of time, I want to thank you all this morning for listening to me. And it's the, the conversation we we're having there towards the end is very nice. And um, I hope I get the opportunity to come and meet with people in Estonia at some point now that the world is reopening up. Indeed, and thanks also for all the AI systems that enable, that have enabled our communication today, our interaction this morning. And now the sun is really telling me that it's it's, it's time to to end our show. Uh, the very very last uh, lecture in our lecture series uh, will be held next Tuesday when Dr. Johann Wendel from Init Germany will give a talk about the advancements in public transit to promote sustainable, connected, and seamless mobility. Thank you very much, Anthony, once again for this morning's talk. We'll be in touch. And thank you also for everyone who listened. Goodbye. Thank you. Good morning. Bye.